Well, good morning, church. Let's all stand to our feet as we begin our service this morning. Follow along, if you will, uh, on the screen, but I'm going to read uh, the first five verses from Psalm 108 as our call to worship this morning. This Psalm of David, David says this, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. Side note, are you guys ready to sing loudly enough this morning to wake up the morning? That's the idea. We're going to awake the dawn with the praise of the Lord. He says in verse 3, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. And here's why. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. I hope you have come to sing the praises of our great God this morning. Let's join our, vo our voices as we start our time and sing of the Lord's love and his faithfulness to each one of us. Change. 
Sun comes up. 
that day? And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near. Good to sing with you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Lord, we sang of your great love and of your great faithfulness to us because that's who you are. You are love itself. You are faithful and true. You never change. There is not one moment of our lives where you've been fretting and wringing your hands about what's going to happen. You are good. Your mercy endures forever and ever. And we thank you so much for it. Lord, we know that we are a sinful people who have fallen so short of your glory. Psalm 130 tells us, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Not one of us would be able to stand before you. Not for one moment. But then it tells us that with you, however, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Lord, we know that forgiveness is found in you and in you alone. There's no other name by which we must be saved. There's no amount of us working hard enough for it or working our fingers to the bone to acquire or earn. Lord, we have received salvation as a free gift, and we are grateful this morning for that. Help us to fear you. Help us to walk in your ways, to trust you and all your promises, that we may be holy and a holy people. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing together of God's incredible mercy that he's shown to each one of us. Let's sing What Love Could Remember. What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea Without bottom or shore our sins, they are many, His mercy is Sing what patience. What patience will wait as we constantly roll. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest. 
Amen. Go ahead and uh, be seated now, please. Let's just continue in prayer on that sentiment that we just prayed about God's mercy. Will you bow with me? Dear Father, we come to you um, recognizing that our sins are many. And I uh, don't want to sing that lightly. That Father, throughout the week, I mean, when I look on my life, I know I don't treat people the way I should. And Father, forgive me. Help us, each of us in here, um, to let go of our anger and how critical often we are, our judgmental nature. Father, have mercy. And truthfully, God, have mercy on us. Father, forgive us when we have worried more about ourselves and really come to trust you. Father, we, we need your mercy. And Father, forgive us, God, when we, um, when we doubt and we're full of anxiety. We worry that you don't have everything under control when you do, God, have mercy on us. And Father, just in our own frailty, I think of people that are struggling. I, I pray for Dave Harrison. I pray you'd have mercy on him. That God, you'd help him in his need and show yourself strong. And then, Father, I personally need your mercy even as I prepare to deliver a very difficult passage of Scripture. I pray that your spirit would override my human tendencies, and that this would be about your son and glorifying Jesus. So, Father, have mercy. We love you, and we praise you for all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And again, Jared... He keeps talking about working your finger to the bone. Jared, what do you get when you work your finger to the bone? Bony fingers. Bony fingers. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. Don't you like my cheap dad humor? It's fantastic. They have asked me to do announcements to their chagrin, so here's my announcements. Number one, our next baptism class is Thursday, April 12th. If you are interested in baptism, have questions about baptism, wonder what our stance is as a church is on baptism. Our class is April 12, 7 to 9 in room 112. And if you would like to be baptized, because our baptism service is going to be the second week in September, this is uh, something we'd like you to attend. So you'll be able to ask all questions there about baptism. Secondly, pray for Caitlin Kerwin. She leaves this week to go to Guatemala for a year. She's going to be teaching at the Christian Academy in Guatemala. So pray for her, pray for her safety, and pray for her effectiveness as she works with the Guatemalan people. And then finally, continue to pray for the youth. They have arrived in Wyoming with a few hiccups. The van had a little bit of problems, and there are some other problems, but they're doing great, and they are uh, successfully doing well in Wyoming. I don't know about Dawson, your mom. I don't know how she's doing. We haven't heard word from her. So you might be lucky. She might not come back. So just pray for them. All kidding aside, I just ask you to stand and greet your neighbor and say hello this morning. All right, you may be seated, and while you're being seated, it was, came to my attention, I said, baptism class is in April instead of August. That's why I need God's mercy every day. It is actually August, so August 12th, 7 to 9. Thank you. 
for your forgiveness? Well, open up your Bibles, if you can, to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 15 to 20, and I'm going to warn you, get ready. The Sermon on the Mount is going to be bumpy. We're almost done with it, believe it or not. You said yay? Who said yay? Man, what is it? What? You need mercy. <laughs> so open up to Matthew 7. It's going to get bumpy. People assume um, when we talk about the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus' objective is to uplift, to be kind, to encourage us in Matthew 7, which he does. But there's also parts in this sermon that get very dark and foreboding, and that's where we are. Jesus' tone gets a little bit more, what I would say, serious. And uh, we need to beware, he's going to say. The message today to me is kind of like entering into a dark forest with spiders and bats ready to come down and swoop down and, and grab you. And so to go through this sermon... I decided to dress up to where you could trust me this morning. I want to dress the part where you can look at me as a preacher that has gravitas. Jacket, tie, the smile, trust me. It might be tough, but you can follow me. I know that some of you like a preacher who wears a jacket and a tie. Actually, a couple people said, you look good today as if I don't the other days. I understand. <laughs> Some people said, especially for service, I love your colors, maize and blue. You're impressed. Dan, you like the maize and blue? He does not like the maize and blue. But I have to be honest with you, wearing a jacket and a tie in a sweltering July morning, I'm uncomfortable. I've never really liked this outfit. My wife is actually saying, that's too puffy. Push that down. But I know I look good. I even shaved today, so hopefully it will add credibility. Some of you who probably never met me before when you saw me said, now that's a guy I can trust. Some of you who know me know that I hate this outfit, and that's not him. In fact, this tie is driving me crazy. It's burning my neck. Even though my mom made me this tie, it's just I don't like it. And these colors, they make me nauseous. It's blue and gold. Ugh. Got to get rid of that. I just want to be me today. I'm just going to be me. So I dress the part today. Actually, I was looking for scarlet and gray Ohio State, and I can't find any of my shirts. I think my son took them all to college. So the next best thing, orange and Cleveland brown. You can't get better than that. But that's me. I got rid of the falseness, and now you see the real thing. You're probably saying, well, why did you do that? For a point. Here's the point, and here's the thrust of the message today. Just because someone looks trustworthy, incredible, on the outside, does not mean that they are on the inside. Especially when they claim to be sent from the Lord. Especially when they claim to be prophets. And I've got a word from God. They may be false. And if you're not careful... They may convince you to follow them down the wide road. If you go to Ken's message last week, he talked about there's a narrow road and there's a wide road. It's a great message. If you didn't hear it, you really need to listen to it. But he said the narrow road leads to life. But the wide road it leads to destruction. And this is really what Jesus is jumping off of. He's going to continue with that theme, and we pick up in verse 15. So if you can follow along, the title for today is Beware of the False Ones. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, 
you will recognize them by their fruits. So the title of this is The False Ones. Um, we get the word false ones from, if you look in the beginning in verse 15, he talks about these false prophets. In the Greek, that word is pseudo dolphus, which means fake brother. And Jesus is saying, beware. And the reason why is because, like I just said, as Pastor Ken said, there's a wide road that a lot of people are going down. And if you go down that wide road, you will be destroyed. So in other words, what Jesus is going to now talk about at the end of the Sermon on the Mount is judgment. That there's going to be a final day when all of us will be judged. And he's very serious about it. I don't think we take judgment that serious anymore. In fact, it's always been a church's teaching, and I think it has almost been ignored. The Nicene Creed, which was written a long time ago, is something that the church-wide has said for years, thousands even, that he, Jesus, shall come to judge the living and the dead. Judgment is coming. Death is certain. And no one gets out of here alive. We know that. This past week, I, I wrote a little blog about Psalm 49. And Psalm 49 talks about how all people die, both the wise and the foolish alike. A person commented on my blog and said, Oh, the tone and the content of your piece conveys an extreme application of the truth of our mortality without balancing the truth that life is a gift that is worth preserving and defending. And I agree with that, that yes, life is a gift. It is worth preserving, defending. We should always hope to bind up the wounds of those who are hurting and to heal those who are sick. That should always be our prayer. However, I think we've lost the other side that judgment is coming. And it's coming quick. We don't like to talk about it, but that's what Jesus is going to talk about all through the rest of this passage. And specifically, he's going to talk today about be careful of the false one who want you to ignore judgment, actually. That's what they want you to do. They want you to enjoy life and forget that it, there's anything like Eternity, condemnation, and hell. Don't, don't let that bother you. Just live your life and have a good life. Like, look how he begins in verse 15. He says, beware. Beware means to wake up. This life's not a game. And the reason you need to wake up is because outside there are false prophets. Galatians 2.4 calls them so-called believers. They looked apart. Sometimes they wear a tie and a jacket. Sometimes you'll see them on television or find enormous amount of hits on the internet. But yet they're not the real thing. This concept of false brothers, I think, for some people is hard to accept. It sounds like I'm paranoid. You really think there's false brothers out there? That sounds so judgmental. Why? Why would there be false brothers? Why would, why would there be? Because it's very simple. It's because Satan is still alive and well. And because Satan's alive and well, so are his minions. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians is right after 1 Corinthians. Just to see if you're paying attention. Chapter 11. Now, Paul is writing to the church at that time about these super apostles, these guys that would come in and, man, could they preach? They would wow the crowd. They were amazing. And in verses 13 through 14 of chapter 11, he says, For such men are false apostles, false brothers, pseudo delta. They're deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So Paul, in no uncertain terms, is saying we shouldn't be surprised if there's false brothers around because Satan himself is always putting on costumes trying to deceive people that he's this fantastic angel. 
What is Satan's motivation? And why would anyone allow themselves to be agents of his evil? Well, first of all, I'm not sure they're aware of it. I think he deludes them. He flatters them about their own greatness and whispers sweet nothings to them, and they fall under his devious spell. I do think there's some that are in, like money, like popularity. I think there are some because they do hate and want to hurt. But it all is because Satan has three tasks for them. And we find it in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10. The thief has come to kill, to steal, and destroy. He's come to kill faith in Jesus. 2 Peter, chapter 1, says these false brothers will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. So they're bringing in destructive or damaging teaching that will cause people to deny Christ. They're going to be stealing joy to take away somebody's blood-bought freedom. Galatians 2.4 says these false brothers will sneak in and spy on the freedom of others. Some of you right now are mad that I'm not wearing a suit and tie anymore. You're spying on my freedom. How dare you? I have every right to wear my Cleveland Browns. But the idea is that these false brothers want control. They want people to live the way they want them to live. They like ecclesiastical power. And then the third thing is they want to destroy this life of grace. In fact, they, they turn grace upside down, and they make grace seem like the ability to do whatever I want to do, and you can't say anything about it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, that they introduce blasphemous teaching causing people to follow their shameful impurity or their shameful ways. So they're basically destroying what grace means. You want to know what grace means? Go to the book of Titus. How do you know grace is real? Because people use this... uh, I'm living under God's grace all the time. Therefore, because I'm living under God's grace... I can go to these gay pride parades and wear my underwear and I'm still okay. Is that what that's talking about? Is that what grace means? I can do whatever I want? Listen to what Titus 2 says in verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. So grace has appeared, specifically in a person. Bringing salvation to all people. And here's what grace does. It trains us to renounce ungodliness, and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. How do you know if you have true grace? You start living godly. You want to live godly. Not, I want to get away with everything now. Paul says it like this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's the point. So how do they do this? How do the false brothers come in? How do they sneak in? Well, they wear a disguise. If you notice, just like the font, you can barely read a disguise and barely see it. The same way they come in and you barely see any difference between them and the other believers. Jesus says in Matthew, if we go back to that, Matthew 7, 15, beware of false brothers who come to you in sheep's clothing even though they're ravenous wolves. So they're wolves disguised as sheep. They wear disguise. Satan is not, he is not, a red-horned beast with bad breath. He's beautiful. He's attractive. He's seductive. And so are the false ones. They look like they belong, and often they're extremely captivating, charismatic. That is why Jesus is warning us, because often they're the smartest in the group and the most convincing. See, Jesus compares believers to sheep, because sheep by nature are gentle and by nature are gullible. We're nice. But that gets us into trouble sometimes when the false shepherd comes in to lead us down the wide road. We fall for it. And Jesus is saying, beware, be warned. You need to be able to detect fraud. So how do we do that? 
How do we detect fraud? How do we determine if somebody is a true minister of the gospel and a false brother? Well, in the Old Testament, there's a whole history of false prophets, and there's some commonalities about them, and I just want to give them to you, four of them, all starting with the letter P. And they're helping you so you can have some categories to detect fraud. The first one is the false prophet will come with a positive message. His message will be extremely positive. Jeremiah 6, 15, 14 and 15 says, the false prophet says, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You bind up the wound of my people as if it was just a minor scratch when it's actually a gaping wound. What this means is that false prophets will do everything they can to downgrade sin and God's hatred of sin. And there will be no mention about our need to repent or our need for redemption. They want you to just ignore how broken you are and what they will do on the opposite is tell you just how great you are. Look how great you are. In a sense, we are made in the image of God. That is a great thing. However, our greatness is only found in Christ, not in ourselves. So when God warns about sin, the false prophet will instantly downplay it. Oh, come on, the road is not narrow. Your view of God is. It's so small, it's so stunted, and so limited. And then they'll snicker and mock, and then they'll say, you know what, though, the path of life, it's inclusive. It's wide. It's a wonderful freeway that is open for all. In Jeremiah 28, I have it up there, there's this prophet named Hananiah. Hananiah was talking to Israel who was going into captivity because of their sin. And he would preach the nicest messages and say, don't worry about it, you, this won't last long. You're going to find victory. And Jeremiah would say, Hananiah, you're lying. And if you keep lying, you're going to die. And it says after his prophesying, a couple years later he died, or a couple months later he died. But one thing Jeremiah says about the false prophet is the Lord has not sent you. That's the question. Has this person who's speaking been given the authority to speak for God, or do they bypass his holiness and try to gain a hearing by soothing the listener you know, through false sympathy and therapy, therapeutic answers. The main message of the false prophet is that sin is not our fault. Sin has been done to us. It's not me doing it. And personal guilt is a thing of the past, like yo-yos and hula hoops. Let, quit delving into personal guilt. Let it go. So don't be concerned with the evil that dwells hidden inside you. Instead, you should come to church to be loved for who you are as you are. God loves me, but God wants me to be conformed and transformed into his image. And this leads to what I would say is a positive or popular following. A positive message brings a popular following. False prophets like to be liked so that they can have people follow them. The larger the following, the more important the prophet believes himself to be, and the more money he usually makes, too. There's another story, and um, you, you don't have to turn there, but I want to read it to you real quick. It's in 1 Kings chapter 22. There was a battle that was going to happen from a pagan nation was going to attack Israel and Judah, and they teamed up together to go fight. Well, the king of Israel said, we should go talk to the prophet. He had 400 of them. And in 22 verse 6 it says, The king of Israel summoned the prophets, about 400 of them, and he asked them, Should I go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should I hold back? So should we go to war or not? And all the prophets, all 400 said, Yeah, go right ahead. The Lord will give the king victory. But the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, asked the king of Israel, Are there any other prophets of the Lord here? We we need to ask him too. And the king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, there's one more man who we could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. 
I hate him because he never prophesies anything but trouble for me. That guy, always, he never has a good word to say. I don't like those kind of prophets. And so they brought him in, and when they brought him in, they said to Micaiah, that was the name of the prophet, look, all the 400 prophets are promising victory. Be sure you agree with them. And Micaiah says, I will only say what the Lord tells me. And so he goes before the king, and sarcastically he says, oh, go ahead, you'll win. And the king slaps him across the face and says, oh, that's why I don't like you. You're always telling me bad news. God sometimes will allow the majority to say and believe the wrong thing just to see who will be faithful to him. Just because something is popular does not make it right. And maybe God allows popular teaching to travel faster than despise gospel teaching to see who really is true and will stay true. And if you don't stay true, people will like you. But if you do stay true, don't be surprised, people might hate you. That's why they are so powerful, those false prophets. So, the point of all of this is the false prophet wants to go to the church and divide and conquer. And so they will suck you in by saying what you want to hear, and then as they suck you in, they will sneak in their devious messages. They will say stuff like this. You don't, you don't want to be in the wrong side of history, do you? Do you? He comes to divide and conquer, and here's how he does it. He polarizes the church. He wants you to hate you, to hate you, to hate you. The point is, Satan cannot attack God. God is too mighty. So who does he attack? The people God loves. Who does God love? His bride. How does he attack God's bride? He polarizes them. He wants them to be divided and to split and to criticize each other and not trust anybody anymore. And he does this through unsound doctrine. In the book of Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Timothy says false prophets are going to come. And they're going to promote meaningless speculations. They're going to wander into vain discussions about genealogies and minutia of doctrine, getting the church to waste their time on those matters that don't mean anything. Later in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says they're going to gather around, people are going to gather around them teachers who will itch their ears, who will say what they want to satisfy their own passions and desires. So instead of preaching scripture and solid doctrine, false teachers will introduce all kinds of heretical teachings to please the sinner. Here's how they, here's how they promote it. They will say truth must change over time. It can't be stiff and solid like dogma. Whatever You know a dogma just means teaching, but they love to use that word because it sounds so archaic. So they will tell you, truth needs to change. Definitions should change. And they, they are changing definitions. So we used to call people who could have children mothers. Now they're people who can have children. Child, people can have children, no longer mothers. And men can have children now, they say. See, they change definitions. They no longer, I was reading in the AP, they're no longer allowed to call somebody a mistress. They can only call them a friend or a partner in love. Definitions must change. And our traditional understanding of God must change. So we reinvent him and we reimagine him in different ways. One, what I would say, prophet of these days, I won't get you his name, says the old ways no longer work. And that's a key word, that word work. What does that mean, that they don't work? What does it mean to make your faith work? Faith is believing God's word regardless if it works or not, because eventually it will work. But we don't believe that something works. We believe because something's true. Because it's true, it eventually will work. But he says this. The old ways no longer work. We need to say yes 
and embrace all the new ways and step into the future together. And this teaching is pernicious because what it does, it encourages soul-killing behavior. Behavior that will kill you and destroy you, humiliate you. Pernicious means it's intentionally evil. Go to Jude. Jude is the book right before Revelation. It's a teeny little book. And Jude was Jesus' brother. Just a interesting fact for people who like interesting facts you can win trivial Bible trivial pursuit but Jude chapter 1 look at verses 3 and 4 Jude is writing to the church and this is getting towards the end and so he's giving warnings in verse 3 he says beloved although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that means stand strong for it. That was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, crept in. False brothers wearing masks. They've crept in who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. That means you can do whatever you want with your body that you want to. And deny the only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. It's pernicious. And those are the waters we are swimming in. I would say in my 25 plus years of ministry, I've never seen the church so divided. Politics does have a part to play in it, but I'm talking about sec human sexuality. It's destroying George Barna uh, gave a list of the top reasons why younger millennials are leaving the church. This is a survey he did a couple years ago. He said there's two reasons why millennials aren't as committed to the church as they once used to be. Number One of the reasons, because the church's teaching on human sexuality is out of date. And number two, the church is too exclusive. They're afraid of letting in the beliefs of other people's faith. It's not being afraid of other people. We just don't believe them. I hate when they say we're phobic. It's not that we're phobic, we just disagree. It's a big difference. Calling someone phobic is slander, actually. So, Barna comes, he continues, so to comply to popular sentiment, some churches have what they, have scuttled what they have traditionally taught and instead are now appealing to culture by building the church on the preferences of the young and not on the pursuit of God. And I think that's where our culture's at. We live in a time where TikTok and social media influencers are the new authority. If it's on TikTok and they look cool when they say it, it must be true. Who are they? I don't know, but they look good. They really look good on TikTok. Who are these social media influencers? I don't know, but they make a ton of money so we need to listen to them as they rip on Christ and the church. And usually they'll sound really, really cool when they talk about things like abortion and stuff. And they have no idea what they're talking about. Where the traditional role of pastors, teachers, parents, and professors are looked down on and ignored because we're just too stuffy, stuck in the old ways. Stuck in dogma. I believe it has never been easier for false prophets to sneak in to divide and conquer as it is now. So beware, is what Jesus is saying. But don't worry, because if you look at the arrest here, it'll make itself known. God has it handled. In verses 16 and 18, he says, you will recognize them by your fruits. You'll recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No, no they're not. So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. In other words, you will know them. You will. It will, be, it will make itself clear. However fruit takes time to grow, you won't know it right away. But it will be clear in time if it's good or bad. As much as the false ones will try to hide their true intentions, 
the truth will eventually come out. But that's some of the problem. I think this is why Jesus is warning. He knows that the false prophet will have some people convinced. He will have his day in the sun. He will have his 15 minutes of fame. And in that time, gullible people will buy into his lies, shipwrecking their faith. But that day doesn't last forever. Be sure your sin will find you out. And when it is, everyone will know it. Second Peter 3.16 said they will be found humiliated. What happens when bad fruit is found out? Verses 19. Every tree that does not bear bad fruit, good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's the wide road leads to destruction. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. So I have three conclusions, three ending points. Number one, evaluate everything you hear by this, by Scripture. Evaluate. If you are not sure of a teaching, ask your pastors. That's what we're here for. We want to keep the wolves from shipwrecking your faith. And if someone wants you to separate from the bride, be very leery. When you hear speakers that rip on Christ's bride, or friends for that matter, say the church is it's a waste of time. Be leery. Why would they say that? I once read this book that said, let's say you had a friend. And you said, oh, I love my friend, but I hate his wife. Would that be a good friend? I love my friend, but I hate his wife. I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Is that really somebody that loves Jesus? Is something to think about. Second thing, don't be impressed by impressive people. Be impressed by solid doctrine and teaching. Jeremiah 6 says, uh, verse 10, who can I speak and give warning that they may be here? Uh, behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen because the word of the Lord to them is an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. And then later in verse 16 he says, but stand by the road and look. Ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in the ancient paths, because there you will find rest for your souls. And in the third concluding point, expect people not to like you when you stand strong on traditional values. Expect it. When your norms and teachings and doctrines are based on the convictions of scriptures, be ready, people are going to attack them. The reason why is because Satan is still alive and well. But hell is also very real. And heaven still requires faith in Christ and his cross alone to enter. Jesus said, I'm still the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So what I'd say, don't sell out for the sake of being like, because someone... Just because someone wears a tattoo or cries that they're a victim or they made a cool new TikTok video doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't. Look for the people who are faithful because in time God will bless them. Look for people who are faithful because in time God will bless them. Let's pray. Father, I, I hope that um, this warning will be listened to and heeded. I pray, Father, that we would stay true to doctrine, that the gospel would be preeminent here, that the message that Jesus died for our sins, my sin, he was buried and he rose again, and that those who believe in you will also rise again. I pray that that will be our message and we won't fudge on it. Help us to be strong. And keep us, keep us free from the devil's schemes. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, before you leave, we have one more thing. And this is a very difficult thing, to be honest with you. It's not something um, I know Jared and I are not looking forward to. But Jared, if you could come on up. My dear friend has a letter to read that um, I really am asking you to Listen closely and be prayerful as, as you listen.
I'm gonna stick to the letter I wrote so that I can try to be composed in front of you all, which was in vain for first service, but I'll give it another shot. <laughs> Beloved church family, uh, when I look back on the last 11 years of serving this church body, I don't just have a collection of loosely tied memories. I see you, I see faces, I see people, I see families, I see the children in our church, I see my brothers and sisters in Christ. And my love for each of you is what makes this announcement so difficult for me. It is with both great excitement and great sorrow that I announce to you today that my family and I um, are resigning from our time as worship pastor at Kent City Baptist Church. We plan to move this fall to Charlotte, North Carolina to complete my seminary studies at Reformed Theological Seminary in preparation for a preaching or church planting ministry after studies are completed. To say that this is bittersweet is an understatement. When we look forward, we, we taste the sweetness as we anticipate with joy what God is going to do in us and through us. When we look backward, we taste the bitterness and are filled with the grief we have never before had to experience. We sense the looming loss of friendships, of ministry partnerships, relationships, and the community that we have learned to love. So here's some history. In the last 11 years at Kent City Baptist Church, God has shaped me and continued to mold me as a pastor. It will likely not surprise any of you here that I have learned to love teaching and preaching the Bible. Was that a surprise to anybody in the room? Okay. Whether it's teaching the Sparkies who soak up God's word like a sponge, or those of you in the sanctuary who open your Bibles week after week to hear the very words of God preached, I have grown to love communicating the eternal truths of God. For years now, I have wrestled and often suppressed a growing desire to preach God's word. I have often struggled with my own fear of failure and with a keen awareness of my own inadequacies. It has often been easier for me to stay comfortable, maybe you guys can resonate, to stay comfortable and to say, maybe one day, maybe one day, but God doesn't seem as committed to my comfort as I have been. It's okay to laugh, that might help me, okay? Um, he has patiently and firmly applied his gentle pressure for his call upon my life. My wife and I have been praying diligently and asking God for clarity and focus in pursuing a path forward toward future ministry. We are completely united in this decision and feel a strong level of excitement and anticipation for this new chapter in our lives. We feel God's peace, even in the midst of a heart-wrenching decision. I cannot express with words the level of gratitude we have for each of you in our church. We are as blown away by your support and generosity now as we were when we came as 22-year-olds. And yes, I still don't know why you took a risk on a 22-year-old. But we did it again, so praise the Lord. All right. <laughs> Not only did you take a risk on a 22-year-old, you showed the love of Christ to us and welcomed us into this church family. Thank you for your unceasing prayers for us, which made our ministry here possible. To the deacons and the elders and the staff of Kent City Baptist Church, thank you for your support of my family, for your encouragement for me to use my gifts, and for your heart to serve this church body, you will be dearly missed. To the worship community of Kent City Baptist Church, thanks for putting up with me all this time. It has been a joy to lead with you. God has gifted you to lead this, his beloved bride each week, and I know you do not take that for granted. Continue singing of the glorious mysteries of God and never tire of that privilege. To the pastors of Kent City Baptist Church, 
Time does not allow for me to convey just how much I love and care for you all. Though our paths must now diverge, I long for the day when we're reunited and I see just how much fruit God has produced in the kingdom because of your faithfulness in ministry. I love you, brothers, and I will miss you dearly. Keep the cross of our Savior before your eyes. All right, to Nora and to Judah and to Zion. Just as Bilbo left the comfort of Bag End and went on an adventure of a lifetime, so too it's time for our next adventure. This life, though short, is meant to be lived for the kingdom and the glory of God. I want you to know that Jesus is always worth it. Oh, I love that this is being streamed. That's even better. Um, <laughs> Callista. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. Proverbs 31.10. Apart from Christ, you are the greatest treasure in my life. And your love for me, weaknesses and all, and your constant support of me leaves me speechless. I'm so grateful to go on this journey with you. Thank you all for the honor and privilege it has been to serve here at this church. I'm not done today, by the way, so I'm not, I'm not dying. <laughs> My prayer for you is what it has been since day one, and we sing it regularly. My friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. My friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Amen? amen. Now and forever, now and forever, amen. To God be the glory, now and forever. Now and forever, amen. In Christ, Reverend Jared Gregory. Why did you do this? No. This, truthfully, this is, uh, I know this has been tearing Jared up inside for a long time. He's come into my office numerous times, and we prayed through this, and I know that him and Callie are really trying to do God's will. And that's all, everybody's job on this earth is to do the will of God. And Jared, you're gifted. You're, you're a gifted man, and we've been blessed to have you here. So thank you for staying for 11 years. <laughs> That in and of itself is your mercy to us. But our job is to pray for him, to encourage him and Callie on their next adventure, and to support them in any way we can. That's, that's what we're here to do. But I just want you, if you could join with me in prayer, we're here to just ask that God would pour out mercy, grace, joy, and that God would use you, Jared, because he's going to. You're gifted, and uh, you really are a blessing. Let's pray. Lord, we love this family, love Jared and Callie and the kids, and thank you for lending them to us. It's kind of you. And now, Father, as they are following you, following your Spirit's direction, I pray that, God, you continue to make the way clear, open up doors that are so obvious and full of joy. I pray that, God, you give wisdom to Jared as the leader that you'd help him make decisions that are best for all of them. I pray you'd continue to give him a hunger for your word, that he just couldn't get enough of it. And I do pray, even as kind of like it goes with the message today, he would speak truth in a world that no longer wants to hear it, that you'd give him strength and that you'd give him conviction, and you'd give him God boldness. And Lord, I just, uh, when all is said and done, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for sending them our way, our way, and now it's our joy to send them on. And I just pray that, God, um, you would be glorified because of this. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me a hug. I love you. Yeah. Really you guys just go. But, um, yeah, if you can, just... Share with them your encouragement and uh, blessing. And we don't know exactly what 
the uh, next couple months are going to look like. But as we do, we'll talk about that. But today's not the time. Today is goodness. for Jared and his family just to share their love with us. And, uh, hey, have a good weekend. May God bless you. Please rise and greet some people on the way out. Thank you.